Well, welcome to Behind the Scenes. This is what we talk about. Um, okay, so uh, for those of you who have no idea what you have stumbled into, you have stumbled into an episode of Astronomy Cast, episode 337. We're going to be talking about photometry today. Did I say that right? Photometry? Mm -hmm. Photometry? Photometry. 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 Um, so we'll take about half an hour to uh, do the actual show show, and then we'll stick around. Now, I've got to run. I've, I'm pulling a Pamela here, and I'm going to be flying on an airplane this afternoon. So uh, we can't stick around for too long, but I will, uh, I will do what I can to sort of bring in some questions before I have to hit the road. Um, and, and I'm going to apologize for last week, and I'll do this on air as well. Yeah. I was really damn sick, and the only memory I have of last week is you flipping your calendar into March, and um, so that may not have been the best episode last week. You, you were not firing on all the cylinders. No, no. I was diagnosed with pneumonia the next day and basically got a stern. You realize there are people as sick as you in the hospital lecture. And right. You could die. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and I've actually got a bit of the cough, too. So I'll be coughing a little just to in tribute to your sickness. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, go ahead, and if you want to ask some questions, you can use the Q&A app, which is... Uh, should be enabled for this episode. Um, oh, did you watch Cosmos last night? We don't get television. Oh, okay. <laughs> Kyle C. says, Ep Astronomy Cast episode 337, why isn't it spring yet? Oh, it is here today. Finally. It is here too! I gotta, I'll got i show you this picture that I just took. Because I know it's, it's, okay, it's to episode 337, non-linear. Non, no, the non-linear episode. I took that oh, picture. Wow. That's my... That's my front yard. Okay, so we're about four weeks away from that. Oh, wow. Well, that's because we're in warm, we're in balmy Canada. Yeah, I took my horse outside on Saturday, and he looked at the ground and nosed the dead grass and asked to go back in the barn. This, this sucks. Yeah. All right, well, let's get rocking. Let's get, let's, let's get into this episode. Okay. So are you, uh, are you ready to press record? I'm, I'm about to be. Yeah. I am pressing record. Testing, testing. La, okay. La. Hi, Preston. Everything's working. Hello, Preston. Once again, we thank you for your service. We're now about to bring you the latest episode of Astronomy Cast. Um, okay. Got my intro. Astronomy Cast, episode 337 Photometry. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane, I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing much better this week, and I have to apologize for last week. We recorded and I was really stubborn and determining not to admit how really damn sick I was. And the next day I got diagnosis of pneumonia and scolding. And yeah, so if last week's episode, the episode on units, was not the best ever episode we've ever produced. For once we can blame you. It's totally my fault. Oh. Totally my fault. Dayquil, NyQuil were not enough to get the neurons firing at full capacity. Oh. I'm better now. Good. Not 100%. Good. Yeah, you, you, do. I, but I, I, you, you look like you're just, you're, you're, well, you're well into your recovery, so. Yes, yes. I, right. I'm at the getting the energy backstage instead of getting the oxygen backstage. All right, let's get on with the show. So there's a lot you can learn by just staring at an object, watching how it changes in brightness. This is the technique of photometry, and it has helped astronomers discover variable stars extrasolar planets, minor planets, supernovae, and much more. And this episode is going to come straight from your head because you are a variable star astronomer. This is super Well, butter. and it's not just variable stars. You can also do photometry on galaxies. And most of the research that I've done and all of the research I've done that hasn't made me hate my computer has been based on photometry. 
So when, when I was in graduate school, I studied variable stars in the Ursa Minor Dwarf Storidal Galaxy. I studied uh, galaxy clusters at what we would now call low redshift, but back then we called moderate to high redshift, which basically means that they're far enough away that they're only a little bit fuzzed out compared to stars. <laughs> and you just kind of treat them like stars when you study them with CCDs. And, um, so most of the work I've done has been, let's take pretty pictures of things, except ignore the prettiness and get at just the science. And even as an undergrad using much earlier technology, it was all about, let's just see that light. So to give me then, I want to hear some stories. So, <laughs> so what was like your research and, and how did photometry kind of play into it? So what, was, what's in, what is the title of one of your <laughs> research papers? Oh, man, the Blaschko effect in R. Lari. Uh, I've done work on H. Leo. I've, uh, man, my, my, unfortunately, master's thesis research got totally sniped by the Hubble Space Telescope, but there's some po po posters out there on using the variable stars in the Ursa Minor Dwarf Seroidal Galaxy to understand the stellar population distribution. Um, that, that may be one of those things where my poster led to one of my greatest moments of sadness in my research career. I, I was at an American Astronomical Society meeting and one of the awesome things about photometry is if you have a reasonably good telescope and you are careful in what you do, you can make up for the telescope being small by just observing long enough. And I observed these faint 20th magnitude variable stars in Ursa Minor using photometry to measure how their, vari how their light varied over time. And with RLRs, the, the period of, of the stars related to, um, well, to metallicity, to type of star, to a whole variety of different things. And then the brightness of the star is related to distance and all of them have basically the same luminosity. So you can pull apart all these different, how many stars have this type of period, how many stars have this kind of period, um, and look at all of this and realize, huh, all of these, even though they're so faint, I can't get a good spectrum of them, are probably made of the same stuff. All of these are basically the same age, and that's just the RLRs. As you keep going looking at stellar populations, when you start to find other kinds of variable stars, each kind is a, a test particle saying, hey, there's stuff this age and this metallicity here, because if there's more or less metals, wouldn't pulsate. If it was older or younger, wouldn't pulsate. And when I looked at Ursa Minor and put together all of the information I could learn from the variable stars, I was able to pull out the details that this little tiny faint system that I observed with a 30-inch telescope, um, all the stars had come out of a single epoch of star formation, which for a galaxy is pretty cool. But it's such a small galaxy that it was basically one of these great situations where this little tiny galaxy used up all of its material for star formation in a single go. And I was stupidly proud of my results, hanging my poster up, getting ready to write up the research paper for publication. And right next to me, Ken Miguel's hanging up his poster on the Ursa Minor Dwarf Galaxy showing the exact same results using an HR diagram with the Hubble Space Telescope and much better quality of everything. Did you just high-five each other, though, and that's just, like, confirmation for both of you? Like, like it, done? There, there was a certain element of that followed by the, I don't need to waste my time publishing this. No! <laughs> Did he not even let you participate in the paper? Like, did you not be a co-author? Well, it, I had nothing to do with his results. Well, I know, but you had your results, and they're I the had same as his results that verify, that would just make them look better. Yeah, but my poster was already going up in the proceedings. You should have just shuffled your papers together and just, and then just <laughs> handed it in. It was just one of those, I spent two years of my life and, like, a hundred nights at the telescope getting my results, and... It could also be accomplished with Hubble very quickly. Yes, of course and it could. Much better and was. All right. So photometry. It is yes. detecting the changes in brightness from an object, be it a star, be it a 
uh, galaxy, a uh, galaxy, accretion disk around a black hole. Exactly. Um, so, so what is like? What do you? What is the gear? What is a photometry thing? <laughs> If I can um, hold a phot photometer, a photometer, photo and... <laughs> a photomultiplier tube, photometer. Yeah. Photom what what would this thing look like? Um, they come in a variety of different forms. The old school ones that still get used if you're trying to do high speed work is just a simple photomultiplier tube. It literally looks like a tube, kind of lame that way. Um, light goes tube, in one you end. Say. Okay. <laughs> light goes one end and it goes light, no light. And it very, very precisely counts the number of photons coming in. You can stick a filter in front of it so that you know what colors the photons coming in are. And what is glorious about these is there's really not a whole lot of data reduction involved. You point your phot photo multiplier tube at the star, galaxy, whatever it is that you're measuring. You then point it at the sky, subtract the value of the sky from the value of the object you looked at. You have your data. And, do you, and like you say, like you can count like the number of photons. Like how how precise can you get with this amount of of, of light? Um, they claim 95% quantum efficiency. Wow. Yeah. So so in other words, your your error bars are going to be not, like if it's within the five percent, then you're probably going to say it's error. But if it's like ten percent, fifty, the, then you feel the pretty confident. The bigger issue comes from the atmosphere. Um. So so you do have to correct for sky glow. You have to worry about changes in transmission of the sky. Um, as your object wheels from straight overhead towards the horizon, the atmosphere is going to start knocking out more blue light. Um, but at the end of the day, the detectors are really good. And this is why, um, with the even not as good CCD cameras, we can spot planets going in front of other stars. That's a photometric process. Kepler uses used photometry to discover planets. And so like what will you get as a as a result? Like I mean you're gonna have the the photomultiplier, you're gonna have this tube on the in front of the telescope. It's only gonna be able to ch see the photons from a very small portion of the sky, right? Like I've seen ones that are more like more elaborate where they're gathering like multiple stars all at the same time or multiple galaxies. Right. So that's but, the C C D. Right. But mostly you're you're aiming for one little chunk of your of your sky, right? The, so like, so res, when the you know the <laughs> Right? You know what I mean? Like the size of right. the sky that you can see is pretty small. So, so when you're doing photometry, what you're interested in is the light from a single object or a single region of light from an object. And if I take and, and take a big picture of the sky and I look at the distribution of the light pixel to pixel to pixel, there'll be essentially a central pixel that gets a lot of light and then the light tapers out towards the edges. The distribution of how the light tapers off depends on the sky, depends on the detector, but it tapers off in a nice neat curve and there's what's called a full width half maximum to this curve and, and so that's the, the width of the fall-off curve where the light at that point is half of the maximum light coming in. And in general, when we're doing photometry, we try and collect everything that's within three to six times what that full width half max is. And that's what we consider the useful portion of the light coming in from the star. Now, if you keep going, our atmosphere blurs that out, light out for a long time. But that's the core light that allows us to get the bulk of the science done without getting a lot of noise from the sky in. Now you said that you can put filters in front. So, for example, if I'm if I'm only looking for the blue end of the spectrum or the red end of the spectrum, I you know if if there's enough light, I guess coming from the star, I can start to yeah. segment that stuff out and see. So, could you have a situation where you know the the the, the overall light of the star seems to be the same, but but there's changes in brightness from some of the photons, from some of the types of photons, like it's well, changing, like the heat. Like I guess if it's heating up, you that would get... changes the entire curve because it's yeah. black body radiation. Yeah. So, so this is one of the awesome things about doing photometry, is with, when you're doing spectroscopy, when you're dividing the light of of a star, a galaxy, a, a source out into that full rainbow to measure how many atoms of this, how many atoms of that, what molecules are there, what redshift is it at, you have to spread that light out a whole lot. So you're starting to get 
less than one angstrom of, of light per pixel, and that's like 10 to the tenth of a meter, 10 to the minus tenth of a meter, tiny fraction of, of the light into one small bit. Well, with photometry, you're looking at sometimes a couple hundred angstroms, a couple thousand angstroms, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. And so you're getting a whole lot of colors of light in. But because the shape of a black body curve is very distinctive, that curve of light that describes the temperature of an object, um, the, the peak of the light shifts towards bluer and bluer colors, the hotter an object is. That shape is very distinctive. And if you sample an object's light at three different places, you can fairly precisely get at the object's temperature because only one curve is going to fit to those three lines. And if you have extra information, you can sometimes even get away with just two colors of light if you have to. Right. So, and I guess, I mean, with with spectroscopy, as you mentioned, you know, the difficulty is getting that light spread apart. The I guess with photometry, the, the real challenge is to measure those slight changes in brightness. That's how you find the planets. That's how you find, you know, that's tough. Well, and, and you're not always looking for the changes in brightness. Sometimes you're just looking for stuff. And and that, that sounds lame, but... Uh, Super lame. Of, <laughs> so, so this is one of those rare shows where we hit nail on with my research. And, and when you're looking for galaxy clusters, you're taking images of sections of the sky and then going through and basically counting the density of objects across your image and what blurriness are they. Um, blurriness isn't quite the right word, but what spread does the full width half max have? Because if you have a beautifully focused, no optical imperfections, idealistic, doesn't actually exist, but we're going to pretend for the points of this episode, telescope. When you look at stars all across your entire field of view, all of the stars will have the exact same point spread function. When you look at how their light forms that hopefully circular distribution that fades from the center towards the edge, all of them will have the same full width half max. They'll all have the exact same shape. You can even at a certain point go, huh, they're all slightly teardrop shaped, but all stars look the same. Now, a galaxy, even if it's far away, it's not a single point of light the way a star is. It, its point spread function is going to be larger, it's going to be um, not necessarily the same shape, and by looking for clusters of things that have not star point spread functions, and that's where you have to start is not star. By looking at things with a not star point spread function, you can say, this cluster of things that I try to do photometry on, this is actually a galaxy set. And then you can start looking at them and going, does the profile of colors match the profile of a bunch of galaxies that are located at the same distance? And you can start to put all of these pieces together to map out the structure of our galaxy by looking at the de density of stars, by mapping out the density of galaxies, you can start to get at where are the clusters, where's the large-scale structure. And in this case, yeah, some of that stuff's varying in light. You have black holes that get accretion disks that vary around them. But if I'm looking for a galaxy cluster off the bat, I don't care about those variations. I just care that point spread function is is not a star. And so can you do things like you know, like I imagine like when you take like just look at a picture of the galaxy of, you know, of of whatever, of Andromeda, and you just see the structure and you see the the star clusters and, and the central core and all looks pretty. But I guess, you know, if you're doing photometry and you're just like carefully going across the galaxy bit by bit by bit, you're going to get these changes in brightness that's going to tell you things about what's going on in there. And and you start to use a different technique when you're doing that. So So in general, when you talk about photometry, you talk about something that, that we say you can put an aperture around. You, you can draw a circle around the object you're interested in and you count all the photons inside of that. You then draw a donut around that aperture, measure the sky, the, the nebula, the whatever that it's embedded in, subtract the average value of that donut and that tells you about what's inside of your aperture. 
Um, when you, you start looking at measuring the brightness of distributed objects, of, of things that actually take up space across the sky. Like you start the looking, sun or like Jupiter, like would that... Well, there you're even getting into completely more mm, different okay. science. Right. So, so we start talking about with galaxies what's called surface brightness, where you start, instead of talking about what is the total brightness of the object, you start talking about what is the brightness per arc second on the sky. You start talking about what is the, then you turn this around with math, and what is the luminosity per unit of volume um, or unit of area, because you can't actually get it volume, unit of area on the sky of what you're looking at. And in this case, you're looking at a changing boxcar average, draw a box, move the box around, see how much light is inside the box. It's a different type of technique, but the detectors that you use for doing photometry on a whole bunch of little tiny things, a CCD, you can also use to do surface photometry um, instead of aperture photometry and start getting at that surface brightness profiling, start looking for dust lanes, star forming regions, how does neb nebulosity vary. Um, it, it all comes down to how much light and what color. That's, that's astronomy. So I want to talk about some of the kinds of research that we'd be wanting to do. I mean, you've talked a bit about it at the highlights, but, you know, what are some of the different kinds of, of observations, the kinds of answers we're looking for, and then what would our setup kind of be like? Like, for example, finding extrasolar planets, right? Well, what's kind of awesome is the setup is the same and the technique is the same for all of the science cases. So your setup is you need a, a device, charged couple device, photomultiplier tube, depending on if you are only looking at one object or a whole bunch of objects. Um, and then you need a telescope that has a very good drive system so that it very precisely moves across the sky and uh, hopefully an atmosphere that doesn't fluctuate a lot because the atmosphere can actually be what kills you more than anything else with photometry. And once you have that nice stable setup that can precisely start counting photons, what you do uh, pretty much runs the gambit and I'll start at the sun and move my way out. Um, people who do solar photometry, uh, depending on exactly how they're set up, they can actually start to measure astro seismology, um, helioseismology. They can look for uh, tremors, pulsations, uh, modes set up in, in the surface of our sun. Uh, moving outwards as we start to look at asteroids, near-Earth objects, small chunks of stone moving through the solar system, when they pass in front of stars, if we observe them from multiple points on the surface of the Earth, the timing of how they block out the light from that background star will start to tell us the shape and more information on the position of that rock moving through the solar system. Uh, if we simply look at the reflected light coming off of an asteroid, we can start to get at changes in its shape as more of it is facing, less of it is facing. Right. Um, as, as we move out, you can take pretty pictures. You start doing surface photometry of planets. That's, that's different. That's pretty pictures. Use a box. Measure what's in the box. Um, but then as, as we move out and continue to move further, um, when you start looking at stars, you can look for flares. You can look for pulsation modes that, that means um, this is this type of star that has this sort of, they're, they're actually what are called harmonic oscillations. These are just like when you blow into a bottle and it vibrates at a set, set noise, you blow harder, it blows at a different set noise, and there's no noise in between those two you can get. Well, stars pulsate the same way. They have allowed frequencies. And, and what pulsation modes you get depends on the composition, the age, the size of the star. And so you can measure the pulsation, and then that tells you some of those other variables that you're interested in. And, and over very long periods of time, and this was the first research I actually started doing, you can look at some of these stars and look 
for changes in their pulsation modes. And as you measure these changes in periods, and, and this was one of my first papers that I did, as you look for these changes in periods, you can actually start to get at the density changes that are going on inside these stars. And we've been studying variable stars for so long that there's now measurable changes. Wow, that's really yeah. cool. And so that tells you other things about even more refinements on on what's going evolution on, models. what's going on with the star. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, you think about all of these events. I mean, I, I know like like what would be the absolute holy grail would be to see, for example, a supernova precursor and to be able to watch changes in brightness weeks before it actually detonates. I mean, that would just be the greatest thing ever, right? To see a supernova precursor. You know, right before I, I, it goes. That's that's all cool, but what what I think is just as cool is what about those moments right before a star goes from main sequence to spending a couple thousand years becoming a red giant? That that death to a main sequence star is the next thing our planet's going to have the joy and death of experiencing. And so there's so many other stages out there. And what's kind of awesome with variable stars is we've been able to now and then, my dog has decided I'm not giving her the leftover Chinese. Sorry, Preston, for the dog noises in the background. Um, it's, it, as, as we watch all these different stars over time with more and more surveys, we're going to start catching stars going from main sequence to red giant branch, moving on and off the horizontal branch. And we see variable stars change modes periodically, showing us their their steps through the evolutionary trails. Yeah, I I wonder if Gaia is it Gaia is going to be able to help out with this at all. Like it's going to be doing really precise uh, measurements of the positions of the stars. But and I very wonder... pre precise photometry. Part yeah, of it I wonder is, if it's going to start getting... to pick up some of these. You know, if you look at all one percent of all the stars in the entire galaxy and watch for changes in brightness. And you've got some of these events that you're looking for. Chances are, you'll you'll catch some of these. Well, so you have three things that you need to worry about. One is uh, getting precise enough data. And with Kepler, we had the most precise data that has ever been accumulated. And people who do variable star work um, basically have a treasure trove that it's going to take us a long time to sort out. Now, unfortunately, stars that Kepler realized were variable stars didn't get observed for the whole duration of the mission because those weren't prime targets for finding planets. But there's still some really amazing stuff in there. So getting the amazing data is part of it. Part of it is getting data long enough. Variable stars are changing periods over a hundred plus years and we have a hundred plus years of data from the ground but uh, not from the sky. So, so is Kepler like just like in addition to uh, all of the work it's done in helping to find all these planets, is it just dumped out mountains and mountains of garbage data for Kepler? Yes. Which is like, oh yeah, you know, the variable star astronomers are just like digging through the trash. Yes. All of this like, oh, you know what, it's a variable star that no one's ever heard of but it's not interesting to us so you guys can exactly. want yeah, I could just imagine how how much of a treasure trove that is for the for the variable star astronomers. Well, it's and, and so many objects. What what gets me is is a lot of people are like, yeah, we don't care about variable stars, but variable stars are what start to put the fine constraints on our stellar evolution models by saying, uh, uh, you didn't explain me. I'm doing this thing over here, and and so while a lot of people who admittedly need money and grad students and stuff will just ignore the variable star data because they're deemed a solved problem because we know the basics. Um, there's a whole lot of data that it, it's not as desperately sought after. Okay, so you were moving out. You got to yes, variable stars. Yes, I got to stars. What about you know, finding planets? I keep so, saying so planets. I don't know why you keep stars. avoiding planets. You, no, I you've just done it again. There You're yet. not interested in planets at all, are you? No, I, I hadn't got there yet. Okay, pulsars. So, so pulsars, uh, you can notice them in radio photometry, basically. Um, it's not all about the optical light. It's all about the stable, precise setup. Um, yes, you can find planets. You can Thank find you. binary stars. Uh, 
And then you can start looking at really neat physics. So there, there's systems with uh, small compact stars, white dwarfs, neutron stars, sitting next to a, a companion star that they're cannibalistically sucking material off of. And those accretion disks of material that build up around them will vary in brightness. And, and so as, as we watch those vary in brightness and periodically undergo radical explosions and things like that, that's photometry. Same physics applies to the accretion disks around black holes and galaxies. So we end up with active galaxies that uh, flicker and you can actually map out the cores of the galaxies using photometry. Light curves um, of supernova? Light curves of supernovae. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's a whole lot of physics going on. Is, is there any sort of value even beyond that? Is anything done with the cosmic microwave background radiation? Because we know that it's used for everything. <laughs> um, there, I don't think you call it photometry anymore. Okay. All right. But there's no point gazing at one spot in the cosmic microwave background and just watching for any changes. Yeah, no. Hmm. But That's it. With We've James reached Webb Space the Telescope... Yeah. The James Webb Space Telescope will be able to start doing photometry on the first stars and galaxies forming in the early universe. That is going to be mind-bending. Yes. Yeah, that that telescope when it comes online, it is going to change it's going to change everything. I mean, we just went through the big NASA 2015 budget and I know everything you love was destroyed. There's going to be no salaries left. We're going to have the yeah. most amazing telescopes out there and no one working in astronomy. Now, I don't know if you've heard, I have volunteered the resources of Canada to help take over some of the maintenance of some of those projects, like, I don't know, Cassini, <laughs> Sophia. <sighs> anyway, well, thank you very much, Pamela. My pleasure. I had way too much caffeine. Not enough caffeine. <laughs> Saving. Okay. Do you have time for questions, or are you running to the airport? Yeah, let's um, let's go for. <coughs> what is it now? Twelve forty. Let's go for yeah. We'll go for ten minutes. Okay. Um, just save. Everything is nice and safe. Um, and uploading. Okay. Um, John Yeager wants to know, how do you become so smart, Pamela? The questions you are seeking are so incredible. I really love the way you're explaining this. Pamela, how did you become so smart? I don't have a single athletic bone in my body, so books were the only option. Yeah, you were you were really really curious at a very young age, and you read everything you get your hands on, and you were shamelessly nerdy and geeky, right? Yes. Is that it? Did I cover it? I, there was lots of shame involved, but I was nerdy and geeky, and I outgrew despite the shame. Despite the shame, despite the shame, you were nerdy <laughs> and geeky, and and so was I. I mean, I, one summer I uh, wrote down a list of all the books that I re read, and I must have gone through a hundred books over the course of, of my summer break, and I was just like, every science, I read two or three sometimes a day, every science fiction book I get my hands on, Yeah. science books, the same way. and I just, and I went through all of the books in the house, and then I went into the library, and I got all the books I can from them, and... Used book sales were my friend, that, yeah. that day that the, I grew up in Massachusetts, and Chelmsford Library, and they still do this, so any of you that are in Massachusetts, this, this could be your mecca, they do a big used book sale every summer to raise money for the library, and at least when I was growing up, the last day of the sale, it was a buck for one of those brown paper grocery bags of books. Wow. Yeah, and, and so, heaven. Well, not anymore, because I hate Adams, so... So I don't like to own anything physical anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, Anish Jaisinghani says, uh, how does a black hole seem to slow time down? Just like um, you got one minute. I, whose perspective? 
I guess from I guess you know the saying goes or the, the thought experiment goes that if you're watching your poor friend fall into the event horizon of a black hole, from your perspective, their time slows down to the point that they are sort of oh, trapped okay. on the surface of the black yeah. hole, and then they're redshifted away and they just fade away. But you don't actually watch the, their horrible, painful the, death. The issue is that they're moving so fast that in order for them to perceive the speed of light that the sa at the same speed that you perceive it, their clock has to slow down. And pretty much, from your perspective, stop. And so you don't actually see them die. What you see is them fade. just get redshifted away as they fade away until yeah. the photons become radio. And you're listening on the radio as they die. Um, That's morbid. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. No. So I should give that to Sigler. He can turn that into a book. <laughs> um, Arstro Saw says, I do turn in every week for the discussions on plumbing. So, yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's what we, uh, that's what we do. Um, well, between your burst pipes and my leaky ceiling, we've had more water inside yeah. than we needed. Don't buy a house. <laughs> There, all right? Don't buy a house. Rent. The only advice I've ever received from Elon Musk was actually that. Yeah, I'm sure. What about rockets? Just don't buy a house. Um, okay. I, yeah, actually. Russell, Russell Bateman, who gave us beautiful views of the moon last night in the virtual star party, uh, I've always had an interest in photometry. What equipment and software is needed for a backyard amateur astronomer to do photometry? I guess we should have, we should have mentioned this, that, that amateurs do great work in mm -hmm. photometry, and... And the variable star, star observers depend on them. American Association of Variable Star Observers, you need a CCD, a telescope, a mount, um, filters. Johnson or Cousins uh, filters are kind of standard. We're, all not, we're also now starting to use the Sloan filters. Um, and then just Maxim DL will get you there, or Apes for Win, or if you really hate yourself, IRAF. CCD uh. soft. Those are software packages. Uh, Reiko Prozo asks, is it possible to take X-ray images using amateur astronomy equipment? No. No. Atmosphere. No. Yeah, so it's not even possible for super professionals to take X-ray images because the atmosphere. You need to use but a what about when rocket. We, yeah, so what about when we launch our, our, um, our amateur telescopes, our amateur space telescopes? Then we could. Yeah, it's it's unfortunately I don't think you can fit one in a CanSat, um, just because the detectors it, tr it X-ray light does not want to be gathered and focused, and so you have to use a very careful scattering setup, and then you have to have a shadow setup. Read about it. It's it's beyond the scope of a quick discussion. Nancy Graziano says uh, you can see Cosmos on Hulu, free. Uh, or Fox or YouTube. Okay, so, haven't got there yet. All right, neither have I. I will watch Cosmos shortly. And you're um, in Canada, so you can't use Hulu. No. <laughs> um, Nancy also notes, I don't believe you're not athletic. You're an equestrian, which is true. I Okay, so there's the difference between uh, by sheer force of will, tenacity, and practice being able to jump my horse over something that is all of 12 inches tall and not challenging to a dog and um, actually having athletic skill. I, I, I lack the skill and have much practice. The horse is doing the jumping. I'm staying on. That's I know, surprisingly I know. difficult. I know. I, riding a horse is just the, the worst. It's like <laughs> so hard. It like ruins my body when I ride on a horse. Um, okay, I think this will be the last question, but I love it. Pamela, can you give a quick explanation of your current research? Of my current research. Right now, uh, I'm doing two different things. I'm working on statistical analysis to understand how well citizen science results compare to professional astronomers' results, or in this case, planetary scientists. And we got our paper accepted to Icarus last week, and the press release should be coming out this week. Um, so Stuart Robbins is the main author on that paper. And then I have to admit that I got sick and tired of people asking me why on earth would anyone spend their volunteer time doing astronomy. And so I've partnered up with some psychology researchers and we're working um, 
I started college as a sociology major. I just switched a few times. Um, no, but but seriously, so part of my statistical brain power and computational ability to do stuff is going into doing large scale surveys of trying to understand what factors cause people to want to participate in citizen science. So there's all of the the comparing I, I've started to become a computational person against my will. Um, so there's all the computational work to try and make sure that moon mappers, all of our different projects at CosmoQuest are producing legitimate science. Um, and then there's understanding why people do this. I think it's hilarious how I'm the one with the computer science degree, you're the one with the astronomy degree, and uh, yeah, and you're often doing more computer science than I do. Um, so, oh, you know what, before we go, I think we should wrap this up, but before we go, uh, we should make a push on Cosmo Academy, because I know we've got a bunch of courses coming yes. up shortly, right? Yes, there's a whole bunch of classes coming up. I have not made it that far through rec I have no memory of the month of February. Nicole is doing a show on astrobiology. Dr. Matthew Francis is doing a show on... Oh, I forget, but it was cosmology, really cool. black holes, dark yeah, matter. like yeah, like the big cosmology type stuff. And then there's another one on I think planetary geology. Anyway, here's the deal: we have we are building a crew of working PhD astronomers who really know this stuff, and you can sit, and there's like eight people in a class, you get really personal treatment, and they will teach you over the course of multiple weeks a subject matter that is at the next level. I mean, this is this is an enormous opportunity. And it's, it's not free, but... No, it's not free. No, no, I mean, this is a... But, I mean, if you've but, got some money and you want to take your knowledge to the next level... Yeah. This is, and, I mean, Pamela sometimes does some of these courses. Like, yeah, this is something I mean, that people have been asking us for. In spring, yeah. Yeah, people have been asking us, like, how can we learn more from you people? This is how. This is how. And, and we priced it based on how much I pay for equestrian riding lessons. Um, I was trying to figure out what does a hobbyist training thing cost. Um, almost all the money goes to the instructors who are taking the time to prepare the lectures, to show up, to prepare assignments. And we're working to build this up. And um, I, I'm sorry that I don't know more. I literally have like almost no memory of the month. I was really sick and in denial until last Tuesday when I got yelled at by a doctor. There you go. Rich Hayward says he's already signed up for Nicole's class, which is going to be awesome. Man, like learning astrobiology from Dr. Nicole Gallucci, I'm, I, I'm jealous. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, this is it. I mean, but I, but at the same time, I mean, we need people to, to come. So go to Cosmo yeah. Academy, check this out, participate in some of these show in, in some of these these courses, and start to kind of, you know, help us help you take your love of astronomy to the next level. You don't have to go get your PhD to to sort of siphon off the knowledge that these people have all spent more than a decade learning. So, so I, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. If you're serious, there you go. Nancy took a course from Pamela through Cosmo Academy, and it was wonderful. Well, duh. I mean, <laughs> that would be wicked. Um, hey, you know what? That's what I've been doing. Seven years of astronomy cast. It's my course yeah. with Pamela. So, uh, Pamela, I'm going to run to my flight. Thank you okay. so much for doing the show this week. Thanks, my everybody, pleasure. for watching. We really appreciate your support, and uh, we will see you all... Friday is the weekly space hangout. I'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure what's going to happen with that for me. Wednesday but, uh, is learning space, and you and I may do a sniper episode, but probably not. We will see what happens, yeah. Cool. Pack right. your mic. What? I'm going to take your mic. mic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I will be taking a moment. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll see okay. you later. Bye-bye.